Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for sticking around. We've got more excitement coming your way. This time, we are talking about data privacy compliance, GDPR, CCPA, everything. All the states that are increasing their compliance requirements and states that are leveling off. You're going to hear all about it from a team of really, really extraordinary group of privacy experts. And this field has become very big for incident response. And um, there aren't that many lawyers that do both privacy and incident response really well, but I think we have a group here who can sort of do them both. So let's start with Andreas Kautsunas. For his, for his bio, Andreas co-leads Baker and Hostetler's National Digital Risk Advisory and Cybersecurity Team. He's a member of the firm's Privacy Governance and Technology Transaction Team and serves as a Seattle Digital Assets and Data Management Leader. Again, we're starting to see the areas of cyber and digital assets uh, begin to converge, which is very exciting for all the lawyers in this space. Andreas also did a stint at Strauss Friedberg of where he managed engagements and advised clients on data breaches and cyber crimes, network and, and data security, internal investigation, digital forensics, and even served as a court appointed neutral forensics examiner in a civil dispute and managed the collection and production of responsive data. What you might miss from Andreas's bio is that he was both a federal and a state investigator first with Kings County Sheriff and in Seattle, and then with the Defense Criminal Investigative Service at DOD. So he's sort of the Raylan Givens of incident response and creates a unique valuable pro value, uh, value proposition, as Eric Friedberg would say, on any engagement. Welcome, Andreas. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. Sure. Next up is Greg Michaels at Kroll. Per his file, our next camel, uh, Greg Michaels is a managing director and practice leader with Kroll's cyber risk practice, specializing in helping healthcare organizations enhance their security, privacy, and digital compliance programs. What you might miss in Greg's bio is that his healthcare expertise does not only come from his extensive training as a digital forensic investigator and seasoned technologist, but also his time as the CISO of a US healthcare organization where he works specifically with various healthcare related software applications and IT investments. He also has an undergraduate degree in biology, a master's in network security, and get this, a, a master's of science in jurisprudence in health and technology law. Typical of Kroll, this is a serious combo of experience and training, very typical of the Kroll professionals. Greg is sort of like Dr. Quincy meets Columbo of IR. Very excited to have you on board, Greg. Thanks, John. Sure. Next up is Sunil Shinoy of Kirkland and & Ellis, and he is a partner in the Government and Internal Investigations Group, where he focuses his practice on advising clients on data security and data privacy matters. What's not in his bio in researching Sunil, what I found is that he's one of the best lawyers around to figure out how to handle one of the hot button issues of the day, and I, I, I'm not sure how much it came up during the day because I didn't get to see everything, is this issue of attorney-client privilege, where we have some very strong and often diverging opinions on best practices. Uh, perhaps Sunil understands the issue best because unlike most of the lawyers here today, before joining Kirkland, he also worked at Deloitte and Capgemini as a consultant while also a lawyer. So he's encountered challenging issues like that before. So welcome, Sunil, to your first incident response forum. Thanks, John. It's good to be here. Sure. And the last bio, uh, the last, pardon me, the last introduction of this panel is the moderator. And you will learn that Heather Sussman is the global co-chair of Oryx Cyber Privacy and Data Innovation Practice and the leader of Oryx Boston office, a force of nature in the privacy area. You may also glean that Heather is a master of state and federal alphabet soup of statutes, rules, regulations, the patchwork of laws, that can kick in during an IR, CCPA, CPRA, CAN spam, ECPA, FCRA, GLBA, HIPAA, TCPA, VCDBA, and the list goes on and on. How can anyone be an expert on all these acronyms? I really don't know, but I do know that Heather knows how to be that. And what you will absolutely not see in Heather's bio is that she can best be described as a cross between Olivia Benson and Brienne of Tarth. Well, why do I say that? Because she was guest lecturing in my class live via Zoom, just like she is today, sitting out outside of her hotel with her laptop, and suddenly we lost the image of her. Five minutes later, she was back on. I said, what happened? Well, someone approached her and tried to steal her computer while she was participating in the class. Not only did she fight them off, 
but she went on with the show without a moment of hesitation, lecturing my class while also watching in real time the police arrest the perpetrator out of the corner of her eye. True story. Heather, so glad you were with us and that you were safe and sound and uh, made it through that ordeal. Thank you, John. Yes, it is a true story. And you gave me the best speaking gift I think I've ever gotten following that speaking gig. It was a box full of pepper spray and mace. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, uh, can't wait to hear what you have today. And uh, you're just so terrific, Heather. I know you're going to do a great job of moderating this great group. So good luck, everyone. And thanks. Thanks, John. Today's panels have done a deep dive on so many security focused issues. We wanted to turn the conversation to what is often thought of as the other side, the other coin, the other side of the coin to cyber privacy. And there are a lot of professionals, as John pointed out, who specialize in either cybersecurity or privacy, but a much smaller subset who specialize in both. And so Bruce and John have assembled this panel to explore the ways in which Privacy laws are shaping how we manage response to security incidents. But before we get into our panel discussion, I'd like to just spend a few minutes rounding the conversation in a bit of historical context. As many of you know, privacy is very different from security. I will often say that you can have security without privacy, but you can't have privacy without security, right? You can't keep information private unless you also keep it secure. So if we travel all the way back to the origins of the Declaration of Independence and its right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, the fundamental right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, the government can't come into my home or into my personal space without a legal right. And then fast forward to today, post-industrial revolution, post-digital revolution, and we've seen the evolution of those rights in the digital context. Let's take surveillance, surveillance laws, for example, as just one issue. These are grounded, these laws, surveillance laws are grounded in concepts of privacy. They're about the protection of liberty, of self-determination. Why? Well, scholars have studied the impact of surveillance on human behavior, <clears throat> that if you know you're being surveilled, if you know you're being monitored, you'll modify your behavior. And in a very localized concept, context, we may rationalize surveillance. For example, a camera that's trained on a jewelry store that has a history of burglary. That would seem reasonable to most, but what about when surveillance becomes more ubiquitous? For, for example, more ubiquitous online. Uh, am I gonna perform, perform that online search to learn something that piques my interest? Or am I concerned that my search history might reveal something private about me? So I actually avoid it. But what if the results of that search would have sparked my interest, for example, in becoming an astrophysicist who ultimately wins a Nobel Prize for my work? The fact of surveillance will have curtailed my behavior, limited my self-determination, and in some, some might argue, my right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And what if we extrapolate that impact across an entire global population, right? Very quickly, mere surveillance begins to shape an entire society. Bringing us back to the topic at hand today, what we see in the world of modern privacy law are these concepts. On the one side, you've got liberty, self-determination, and the right for people to be free from intrusions upon seclusion. And on the other, you've got a coalesce, coalescing around these same concepts applying not just to you as a person, but also to information about you. Information that can be used to identify who you are, which we call, of course, personal information or personal data. Modern privacy laws extend these inherent privacy rights that you have as an individual person to also cover information about you that's traveling out in the digital world. And those privacy laws, as you'll hear today from our panelists, are increasingly requiring a minimum level of security to protect personal information, such, such that breach of a requirement of protection is a breach of that underlying privacy law, triggering the potential for regulatory investigation, fines, you know, whether it's GDPR in Europe, LGPD in Brazil, HIPAA, GLBA, 
anything else in the acronym soup that John rolled off earlier today, uh, it's true. And in some cases, like with the CCPA in California, the law provides for private right of action and statutory damages up to $750 per affected individual. Now, that's a game changer in the world of incident response, because an incident involving 1 million California Social Security numbers, for example, carries the risk of a $750 million judgment. That's fundamentally a privacy law that's driving this extraordinary level of risk. With so much at stake being driven by these privacy laws, decisions that you might make in the incident response process matter and can have a cascading effect on liability and risk. And that's really what brings us to the intersection of privacy law and incident response. We'll hear today from Andreas, who will talk about common privacy law principles that underpin privacy law today, particularly in the United States, and how complying with those principles can actually reduce the risk of a security incident, or at least reduce the risk or reduce the impact of the fallout when one occurs. Sunil is gonna zero in on those principles, talk about the concept of security, the principle of reasonable security as supporting privacy law compliance. And Greg will explore practical ways to implement reasonable or appropriate security, meeting privacy law compliance requirements around the globe, and the challenges with doing that against the onslaught of threats that we've all heard about today in great detail. And hopefully if we have time, we'll round out the discussion with tips on issues like preserving privilege. That's about protecting privilege information rather than personal information, but it's a huge risk issue given where privacy enforcement is going. We'll cover how some privacy laws and regulators around the globe are influencing how US businesses respond to incidents spanning many jurisdictions. And again, if we have enough time, we'll even cover the landscape of privacy law enforcement and how that comes into play in the incident response context. So with that introduction, Andreas, let's talk about common privacy law principles. What are they, why they matter, and how can following some of these principles actually reduce the risk of a breach or at least the fallout from one? All right, thanks, Heather. So. Yeah, let's set the stage for the rest of the discussion by talking about these principles. And, and when we talk about these privacy data protection principles that, that Heather's been mentioning, um, you know, they really have their origin in two places. One is this emergence uh, really back in the 1960s, many decades ago now, of automated data processing and the ability to collect and really analyze data on an unprecedented scale that just is not possible when you're handling paper records and, and don't have uh, computerized systems involved. And so it was really this emergence of sort of mainframe systems and, and computerization uh, that, that created these, these initial concerns for um, broader privacy and data protection principles. The second, uh, again, thinking back to the 1960s, um, was the abuse of information about people that led up to and occurred during the Second World War. And with these abuses still very much uh, fresh in people's minds, they were also contemplating the implications of these, these new automated processing technologies. So these, um, these two driving forces really led to the creation of these, um, these principles and, uh, and, and evolved into what we refer to today generally as sort of these fair information principles, or you'll sometimes hear them called the fair information privacy principles, abbreviated FIP. Uh, and so, um, for those of you who um, operate, practice in uh, the European Union, you're already uh, very familiar with these principles. They've been embodied in the EU's GDPR and the Data Protection Directive uh, before it. Um, likewise, for those of you who may operate in specific sectors in the US, whether it's healthcare or um, the financial sector, you'll, you'll be familiar with these in uh, HIPAA, or GLBA in the financial context, or for those who operate in the government space, even in the uh, Federal Privacy Act that um, has been with us since the 1970s. For the rest of you, um, if you operate outside those specific sectors or without a strong international footprint, um, this is gonna be new territory. And uh, many have operated with um, general privacy notices in place, but without uh, really having to think too much about sort of these privacy principles behind them or what we're trying to accomplish. But uh, this is changing with these new laws that have been in California for the past couple of years and now the new laws in Colorado, Virginia, as of a month ago or so, now Utah, 
and uh, can expect more, I imagine. Um, these laws are bringing these principles to our doorstep here in the US at a broader scale than ever before. And we're seeing internationally other regions, whether it's APAC, South America, uh, and others, uh, regulations similar to the GDPR that are, that are embodying these principles in, in, in legislation in those regions as well. So what are these principles? Um, we're obviously not going to do a, do a deep dive into these, but we'll just touch on some important ones that will ground the rest of our discussion. Um, the first is this idea of transparency. People should know and have notice about what information you're collecting about them, what information you're processing, how you're processing it, and the purposes behind that processing. And, and so that, that idea of notice to individuals about what you're doing is, is, a, is a key foundational piece. Um, from that, the notice, uh, the other piece is, in the U.S. at least right now, it largely flows into what you'll hear referred to as notice and choice or notice and consent, which is this idea that once you're told what, you, you know, what an organization is going to do with your data, you should have the opportunity to consent to it either explicitly or through some sort of implication um, because you're continuing to use the services. I will note just um, briefly here that, that this idea of notice and choice and consent is uh, questioned, uh, whether it's really providing the, the foundation that people need for, um, for clear sort of choice. And so in the EU, for example, they, they opted for a slightly different approach, which is to require a lawful basis of processing that's, that's, uh, that's provided for in the law, um, uh, regardless of whether people are, are sort of providing the, the choice or consent for that, for that use. Um, the second uh, critical right that's provided for in these principles is this idea of data subject access. So not only should you know what's happening, but you should have the right to access and understand further what information an organization has about you. And then tied to that is this right to both ask an organization to delete the data about you in certain circumstances, or if it's materially incorrect, to be able to correct the information an organization has about you. Um, another key uh, principle is that uh, is this principle of information security. So as Heather was saying, there's this sort of two coins and, and it's one thing to have privacy, it's another to have security. Um, an organization could be doing everything they should be doing on the privacy side, collecting data in the right way, using it in the right way. But if they're not also securing the data while they're doing the right things with the data, then, then it's a problem. So, not, so you must also uh, secure the data. Uh, and we'll be talking about that more throughout um, throughout the hour here. And then finally is just a, a, a general set of principles around the life cycle of data from collection on the front end all the way through sort of dis disclosure, um, excuse me, through uh, disposal on the back end. So we want to make sure that organizations, these principles want to ensure that organizations are collecting data only for uh, notified and, and allowable purposes that once it's collected, it's being used in ways that are consistent with those purposes and only for those notified purposes, and that data is only being shared and disclosed in ways that are consistent with those purposes. And then one key point that we'll be re returning to is that organizations are also only retaining data um, for as long as they need to, to satisfy those purposes. And that will tie in uh, nicely with some of these incident response concerns that we have. So I'll, I'll stop there um, with, with that as a, as a quick overview of these, these principles that we have and we can build from there. That was really helpful, Andreas, because I think, and that, that touch on data minimization, which I know we want to drill down into a little bit more. I also heard you talk about notice, transparency, and sort of what you put in your privacy notice. In the incident response context, what's so interesting is that we see privacy notices where sometimes companies make these grand over promises about what they do with data and that's often the fodder either for the Federal Trade Commission or state attorney general to review and say, well, that's a deceptive statement. And on the unfair and deceptive acts and practices, the prohibition on, on businesses committing unfair and deceptive acts and, acts and practices, then that, that, those kinds of sort of boasting and you know, overstatements and privacy notices can be used against the company following a breach. And so we often say one of the best things you can do is really carefully review your privacy notice to make sure that what you've got in there is not you, know, you want to ground it in fact and not overpromise, um, particularly in the area of security, right? That's one area where you say you're going to promise or guarantee security because, you know, that's, that's 
that uh, if somebody can actually do that in the course of their business, then they really will be a, a you know, <laughs> that is the unicorn. Yeah. Um, no, I, can you tell me a little bit about inventories, though? Because I, I know you've talked a bit in, our, in some of our prep sessions about this idea of inventories or understanding your data flows. Um, what is what's the role that a good in data inventory can play or I'm sorry, the role that a good data inventory can play in helping you comply with these principles that you're talking about? Sure. So I think, you know, for organizations that had to start complying with the GDPR a few years ago or that are, you know, had to do CCPA or now thinking about these new state laws, they're finding the first thing you got to do is really understand what data you have and, and where it's going and, and how you're using it. And it really is a critical step, right? If you're going to tell people in a privacy notice about what you're doing with data, you've got to obviously understand that yourself before you can start putting it in notice. And to your point a moment ago, you know, we, we did see in the past a lot of unforced errors, companies putting things in their notices and, and boasting and overstating things that are getting them in trouble. What we're seeing now is that there's more requirements about what you put in your notices, right? You've got to be more clear about what data you're collecting, how you're using it. With the CPRA coming up in California, there's a new requirement on disclosing your data retention practices, which I think is going to be a huge problem for a lot of organizations and, um, and, and, and create that problem where are you actually doing what you say you're doing in the data retention space? And so understanding your inventory is critical to putting out that correct notice and making sure you're not making statements that are going to potentially get you in trouble, not only with that state regulator, but as you made a you know, point a moment ago, also with the FTC, because the FTC is going to care about what you're putting in your notice. And if you're doing things inconsistent with that notice, you're opening yourself up, not only the state regulatory enforcement, but also to general uh, UDAP enforcement for making unfair or deceptive statements. Um, so that that's part one. The other way that this ties into the incident response space, right, is we all know those of us who do incident response that one of the first questions we ask is where where was this data or, or what data do you have in these systems? And very often we get finger pointing across the table or blank stares. And so if you think about trying to kill several birds with one stone here, you can use this data inventory process, not only for your privacy compliance work, but think about how to build that into the preparations for your incident response also. And think about how can we use this when we have an incident to quickly home in on what was taken, what could have been taken and how we want that to influence our response process. I love that point. Andreas, that's such an important takeaway, right? That your inventory, knowing where your data is, not only helps you with privacy law compliance, but also helps you in the incident response context. We see a lot of privacy compliance teams struggle with budget too. And so that's an area where you could actually combine budget from both your information security team and the privacy team to potentially have the opportunity to go and get that inventory project completed, which, yeah, from our context, saves so much time and energy after the fact and, uh, when you're when you're dealing with trying to understand what was impacted and where at the level of sensitivity. So just as a final point, I know you touched on this briefly, but the data the concept of data minimization, because um, you know, inventories, data minim it, it, talk to me a little bit about that. When how, what what are some tips for actually implementing that principle and where are you seeing that have the most impact in the incident response context? Sure. So um, embodied uh, in really all in these privacy principles generally, right? When we think about sort of restrictions on use, disclosure, um, retention, it really, you could sum that all up as this is, this is a requirement of data minimization, right? Only collect what you have to for the purpose that you're, that you're seeking to accomplish. Don't keep data longer than you need to once you've, once you finish that purpose. Right. And, and so that's a, that's a basic requirement that is, that exists in the GDPR. It's absolutely embodied within the, the new laws here in the U S and, and it is a change in the way of thinking for many organizations, right? I, we hear many organizations that they'll say, well, I, why do you keep this data? Well, I, we just don't know when we, we might need it for something. And, and there does need to be a sort of cultural thrift shift in, in thinking about this differently, right? And, and so that's for the compliance piece. How does this help an incident response? Well, we all know that the easiest way to avoid an incident is not have the data in the first place, right? So there's a nice connection between minimizing data for your privacy compliance purposes, but also significantly reducing your, your risk on the incident response side as well. If you have, a, if you have an incident where you know, an attack, 
let's say the common thing we all deal with, right? Nuisance, these sort of business email compromises, they get into an email store. It's always better if they're getting a year of data instead of the 20 years of data because no one's ever thought about how long we're keeping the data in the system. So there are, there are absolute connections between the data minimization on, the, on the, just the compliance side with privacy requirements, but then also how that lessens the risk and the impact, as you said before, uh, in, the case of, in the case of an incident. All great points. Thanks, Andreas. And I'll come back. I've got so many follow-up questions for you, but let's reserve it for our later conversation and turn now to Sunil to zero in on the principle of security. You know, let's talk a little bit more about that, where that principle comes from, and how should companies be thinking about demonstrating compliance with that principle? Thanks, Heather. Um, so as I think you and Andreas have already mentioned, right, security and privacy go hand in hand. Uh, it's really critical to think about both of them together. Um, what we're seeing now in some of the privacy laws that are coming out is that they're sort of explicitly tying together those two concepts. So for example, in the CCPA, uh, we see there's a provision that requires companies to implement reasonable security procedures. Uh, the GDPR has something similar and says that companies are required to implement measures to ensure a level of security that is appropriate to the risk. So again, essentially reasonableness. And, and there's um, other similar concepts in other laws as well. So the question is really how do you figure out what reasonable security is. Uh, it's difficult for anybody to say that a company should do these five or 10 things, and then you'll have reasonable security. Um, part of that is because you know, what a company needs and what's reasonable for a company really depends on the company. There's a lot of factors to consider, size, scope, uh, the industry, what the you know, business really needs to do, uh, a lot of things to consider there. So when you start to think about what reasonable security is and how you can find out what's appropriate for your organization. Um, there's you know, probably three or sources of information you'd probably look at, right? So first, you, know, you can look at laws and regulations. There are some laws and regulations that actually talk about particular uh, security concepts. So um, for example, the Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts has a state law that sets forth a number of um, practices that companies should implement. New York, uh, the Department of Financial Services cybersecurity regulation has uh, several requirements for things companies should do. Um, some regulatory authorities have also issued guidance. So that's sort of the second category. So for example, the California State Attorney General's Office has put out a couple of reports that talk about controls that companies should have. Um, as always, you can look at past regulatory enforcement actions to see what other companies have done wrong and realize that the Regulator thinks that's an important thing to do and considers that to be part of reasonable security. So, you know, you can find out guidance that way as well. So the third thing to look at is really best practices. And so that you can divide up into a couple of categories as well. But first you can start with, you know, industry frameworks. So in the privacy and cybersecurity context, uh, there's some really great frameworks that a lot of organizations use like uh, the NIST privacy and cybersecurity frameworks and also the frameworks that are put forth by ISO. Uh, there's also many experts who can provide guidance on how companies secure their systems and data. We are fortunate to have one of them on our panel today, and I know we're going to speak to Greg a little bit later and, and get a lot of his views there. But one thing that's important to note is that there's a lot of overlap in all three of those categories, right? In terms of what the law says, what regulatory guidance says, and also what the best practices are. Um, so for example, almost every uh, authority will tell you you should have some sort of policy regarding privacy practices. You should probably assess your program in some way. You know, there's a lot of uh, concern about the risks introduced by interacting with third parties. So a lot of different ways to address that as well. You know, one basic requirement that a lot of things have is to have the right personnel. So you might be required to have uh, somebody who's in charge of privacy and responsible for privacy at an organization as well as security. Um, you know, I think a lot of the guidance that we see doesn't always get specifically into the nature of the particular technology you should use. One thing that's very common is the rise of multi-factor authentication. Um, it can be really significant. It's one of the few things I think that, you know, regulators are, are willing to say is really important. Um, regardless of what organization you're in, putting some sort of MFA in can be really valuable and cut down on a lot of different threats and help protect your data. Um, ultimately, I think the devil is in the details, right? The, how you implement your security really matters. If, if a company doesn't implement their security properly, then a regulator is very likely to say that the company didn't have regular, uh, reasonable security, even though it has 
you know, maybe a hundred different things that it's done in the last you know year to sort of improve its security. And you know, working on on the privacy side of the house, and also uh, with companies on cybersecurity matters, we see unfortunately a lot of implementation errors. So, for example, you know, a company tried to implement multi-factor authentication, and it wasn't configured properly. Or, for example, Amazon AWS settings, you know, allowed data or access to data that maybe wasn't intended. So, you know, a lot of these things can lead to incidents and litigation and government investigations. And so, you know, reasonable security is, you know, taking a greater role in a lot of the privacy laws and regulations that are out there now. You know, as we start to see more laws, I wouldn't be surprised to see that concept built into more laws. Um, and it's one thing that, you know, will really help companies uh, improve their privacy programs if they're also thinking about reasonable security. Yes, Sunil, you mentioned the Massachusetts data security regulations. It's 201 CMR 17. NYDFS takes an even more prescriptive approach and actually expands its coverage to not just cover you know, personal information, but also co confidential company information or financial institution information. Does the size and scope of the organization come into play when determining what's reasonable? Do you think, is it better to have a really prescriptive law that lays out what the minimum security requirements are or something that just says reasonable security and lets the industry figure it out? Well, I think that the size and scope are definitely two um, factors to consider. I think the, the laws, you know, may vary based on, you know, what the target audience is, right? So the Massachusetts law is, is more of a general purpose broader application any company that does business in Massachusetts has to think about that law. The New York DFS is more targeted toward financial institutions that are going to have certain types of risks and certain types of operations that are probably going to have more similarity than all of the companies that do business in Massachusetts. So it might make sense for a law like that to have be a little bit more prescriptive in the same way that HIPAA can be a little bit more prescriptive because companies dealing with medical data um, you know, can be can maybe have a little bit more similarities. So there might be some more um, similar requirements in the law. So again, I think size and scope are two definitely relevant considerations, but not the only ones. I think, um, you know, companies should also be thinking about, you know, as we've said, the type of data that they have, the volume of data they have, you know, the IT infrastructure, uh, what the business really needs to be able to do to function, right? Company, some companies are very interactive with customers. Some are more backend that, that really only deal with other businesses. And so the nature of the business uh, really affects sort of what a company should be doing in terms of its security posture. That's great. And so evaluating the risks to your business in particular, which we're going to get into when we talk through with, with Greg, how to actually um, you know, put in place a program that complies with some of these legal requirements. Is there such a thing as perfect security, Sunil? What do you think? <laughs> Uh, well, I think that's probably the one thing we know for sure is that there's there is no perfect security. Um, yeah, I think the only way to really have security, a perfect security, is to not allow anybody access to data and not allow um, you know that data to get out in any way. Right? You put it in a vault, you close the vault, and and seal it off, and nobody can ever get to it. That that's not really helpful for anybody. It's not really helpful for businesses or individuals. So, uh, I think that you know perfect security is is um, an ideal, and we shall be striving for for that. But recognizing that um, that's sort of an elusive goal, and, and something that's more practical is really what the law requires. So death, taxes, and no such thing as reasonable security. <laughs> we can. Yeah, that's right. right. That's what. That's one way to put it for sure. <laughs> All right. So I talked at the outset a little bit about this game changer under CCPA, where if a company fail, fails to implement reasonable security pr to protect certain kinds of personal information, the, the more sensitive information that you're, you've been talking about, the CCPA allows a private right of action following a breach with maximum, um, or sorry, minimum statutory damages available. How has that risk affected how you advise clients in the breach context? Yeah, that's a good question, Heather. So maybe I'll take that in two parts. I think, you know, Laws like the CCPA have really gotten companies to think about privacy and security upfront in advance of a breach, which is really great um, because it's not just about complying with the law. I think companies have really just understood the significance of those of privacy and security. And so companies are also starting to see the business value in having good privacy and security programs. So doing a lot more proactively um, upfront, which is good. But then secondly, when a breach happens, I think laws like the CCPA and others that have a private right of action, I mean, there's, there's a BIPA, TCPA and others, um, you know, 
I think people who are in the incident response field may start thinking about litigation, the risks sooner than they might for companies that maybe are not subject to a law like the CCPA. Um, so one of the challenges is when you have an incident, it can be very hectic. You know, a lot of times people would say chaotic in the event of a breach. And yet now you have to layer on, oh my God, when are we going to get that first lawsuit? What do we have to do to be thinking about defending against litigation, right? That litigation risk is not there for every type of breach, but you know, when you're subject to the CCPA, it could very well be. And so I think it just requires a lot more careful consideration about really what to say to consumers, what to say to business partners and regulators after the breach, you know, how you're going to approach evidence collection and storage, um, how you're going to interact with your experts and advisors, whether it's your counsel, uh, the, the forensic firms uh, that are helping you in the wake of a breach. Um, there's a lot more to consider uh, when you have that litigation risk. And so, again, um, it definitely changes things for sure and, and raises the stakes. Those are such great points, too. And it's not just like, what do we do after the breach? But it's one of the areas where so many companies can now focus. Look, if, you've, if you're processing that kind of information in California, your stakes have gone so far up, but that may be the area where you want to focus your controls, right? If you, if you can't have perfect security, you can't boil the ocean, you don't have all the money in the world to throw at a security program, focusing on the areas that can potentially present the greatest risk to the organization is a good place to start. So Greg, Greg, we've heard you've been very patient. I'm now going to call you Columbo. I can't resist after that introduction. So patiently listening and evaluating what we, the lawyers, are saying. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about how we then take the law and actually apply it in practice? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and you know, I've I've got many many good tips from from lawyers in in the past. So uh, I I don't mind sitting here and, and getting more good advice. You know, I think I think one of the most important things about privacy and security is that it's it's a continuous process. Um, you know, it, it needs to be. Uh, we need to continuously be evaluating. You know, our our organizational risk profile. You know, the threats that are out there, the data that we have, where that data is, because it's always going to be changing. Um, you know. I think all of us have seen, you know, this is a very dynamic space that, that we all live in, uh, this cybersecurity and privacy world. Uh, laws are changing all the time. The guidance is changing all the time. The frameworks are changing all the time. Just trying to keep up with uh, the different attack vectors, uh, you know, is, is, is very difficult. So what, <clears throat> what I always try to do when, when building these programs is, is make sure that I have um, <clears throat> the, this continuous process. I wanna use automated tools where possible so that I can understand types of data, system inventory, assets that, that I'm managing. Uh, I want to look at you know, ge general threat intelligence feeds that, that are out there to understand you know, what are the latest and greatest threats. Um, I want to be looking at um, those, those inventories on, on a regular cadence, um, understanding uh, what data I have, where it is, who has access to it. Um, you know, how long it's being retained, how it's being destroyed, those sorts of things that we alluded to in the beginning. Um, and then I wanna constantly be looking at my uh, privacy and, and security controls uh, and processes that are in place. Uh, and by doing that continuous evaluation, you know, it's a, it can be a little painful in the beginning, but once you start building on it, you're really just kind of reassessing the same, the same um, <clears throat> controls and processes that you looked at before, you're looking at new uh, data or new systems that, that may have been put in, and, and that process really uh, flows from there. So I, I think that's a, a real good, good takeaway uh, for this. And then <clears throat> with the, with the, the laws and, and the regulations and the frameworks, just, just understanding the, the changes, because you know, we, we have seen you know, the breach notification laws came out, and you know, then all of a sudden there were 50 of them. Uh, the privacy laws, uh, are coming out now. I think there's four or five of them, um, but there likely will be more coming. Um, you know, not to mention international uh, considerations that that we have to take. So, those are those are some good ways to to get started with with the process, and um, I think they'll they'll really add value and give you that visibility that that you need to be able to manage these risks. 
So, Greg, we heard from Sunil earlier this idea of how size and scope of the organization, the type of the data that you collect, your business needs, process systems, all of that can go into influencing the types of controls that you might put in place. Um, there's also this concept that you'd layer in about maturity, right, and then the level of maturity of a particular program. How do, um, how do we factor in things like size and scope or sensitivity of the data? How does that influence the maturity score or what a company should be striving for? I mean, if you're a small organization, do you want to try to strive for perfect security? Is there some balancing that should happen? How do we think about maturity in these contexts? Yeah, I, I, I think it's what, I mean, that perfect security, you know, I think we, we already confirmed that doesn't exist, but reasonable security certainly does. And, and I think there is um, some rate sizing, uh, you know, as, as, some people call it that that needs to that needs to be factored in. Um, you know, the Fortune 50 companies of the world are much different than you know a, a small law firm, as an example. The the data is still just as confidential, um, but you know you're going to have you're going to have more resources to to manage it with the the larger company. You're going to have more uh, budget for technology solutions and, and things like that. So, you know, I think what what companies really need to do. A understand the risk profile. Uh, you know, are they are they a healthcare company versus uh, you know a, a manufacturing company or something like that? You know, how much data is there? How confidential is that data? How well protected is it? And then you know, some of the points in the very beginning, I think, were really important. Um, you know, we can protect data in in a lot of different ways, and there's multiple ways to to get controls and processes. Uh, you know that that work within a particular organization's budget and resources, um, but I think uh, that concept of limiting um, the data. You now, with with a lot of um, organizations, you know, maybe you can hold that data for for less of a period of time, uh, but also like smaller companies have the the great uh, ability to limit the areas where their data is, so they can keep their data on one server or maybe in one cloud environment. And not let that data uh, you know, be in multiple jurisdictions or, or multiple uh, regions. So you have you have some ability, um, oftentimes there, to limit where the data is, and then it's easier to control and monitor and audit, uh, you know, where where that data is and what controls are in place. Uh, some of the other things that are really good is, you know, smaller organizations have the ability to pick up the phone or you know, confirm. Things like, you know, if they get an email asking for you know, wire transfer data to be sent or to, you know, send this email, they, they can confirm it. So, you know, there, there are some, you know, processes, I think, that can be uh, built into any size organization that will help in that right sizing and limiting of the, the data and ultimately the risk. Greg, can you give us what some of your best, your, your tips, the best bang for the buck, when you don't have all the money to spend on your security program, are there controls or processes that you see consistently making a difference at reducing security risks or, or breaches? Yeah, absolutely. We've talked at length about MFA and, and even yeah. Sumita said proper configuration is so key. You gotta, you, if you're gonna enable MFA, you gotta disable legacy authentication. Those are just sort of like basic fundamental tenets. So let's just assume we've got MFA. Are there other, what are other things that we should be looking at? Yeah, so I think one of the one of the most important things is is doing um, doing your basic uh, patching, you know, yeah. blocking and tackling. You know, I think is is really important. Make sure, you know, and, and you see it all the time. We all we all have our phone and our tablet devices, and the the update pops up, and you know, we we run through and do the software updates. Uh, but it's the same thing with your your systems, your network devices, your printers, your applications. They all need to be kept up to date. And, and that goes a long way towards uh, making, uh, making for a safer environment. Uh, so I think that's one thing. And, and that's, that's low, low budget. I mean, it takes time, it takes resources, but you know, low budget for, for most of that. So I think that's really important. Um, I think having, uh, having the ability to, to monitor uh, your systems, uh, to understand what potential risks there are, the the monitoring tools have gotten uh, you know, really a lot better than they have in the past. They've gotten pretty comprehensive, uh, and there's a lot of options for it. So you know, whereas larger organizations can bring in their own tools and you know buy best best of breed tools, 
uh, smaller organizations can look to outsource it. You know, there's a lot of providers that will basically provide 24 by 7 monitoring services, uh, you know, whether that's monitoring your data, monitoring your security, monitoring your system and, and processes. You know, all those options are out there and, and they come at pretty reasonable prices. So I think those, those are probably two real good ones. You know, MFA, obviously, you know, I think we all know that's a, a good solution. Um, another, another one that I'll, that I'll add, you know, a lot of us are moving towards, towards cloud and SaaS-based solutions, yeah. um, you know, spreading our data out and uh, understanding that those environments are not secure by, by default and that they do require you know, some level of assessment, uh, ongoing assessment, but certainly before moving our data up there, uh, as well as testing. You know, with, with AWS or Azure, you know, all those environments can be vulnerability test. Um, you know, that's permissible penetration testing, application security testing if you're building uh, web apps and, and things like that. But doing that assessment, doing those, tech, uh, doing those testing uh, of, of those environments, they're often somewhat lower costs um, you know, than um, you know, bringing, in, bringing in a team to, to do it yourself. So those are those are some pretty good ways to uh, to stay protected and, and make sure that uh, your systems and and versioning is uh, up to date. Thanks, Greg. So Sunil, I'm going to turn it back to you because John said he wanted to hear about the law of privilege. So let's tell tell us about it. We've been talking about privacy law, of course, and in the law of reasonable security. How does the law of legal privilege play into it? Yeah. So I think one of the issues that people run into with um, privilege is that a lot of companies think that as soon as you have a lawyer involved, everything is privileged, right? Every word that's spoken, every document that's written, everything is protected by the attorney-client privilege. And, and really, that's not true, unfortunately. Um, you really have to think about it in terms of two ways, right? What is um, actually subject to either the attorney-client privilege or the attorney work product doctrine? Um, and when it comes to a, the attorney-client privilege, you're really focusing on protecting communications, and so you have to ask, you know, is the communication really seeking legal advice or is legal advice really being provided? And unfortunately, I think when you get into it, there's a lot of communications between clients and lawyers that are not really about legal advice. Sometimes it can just be routine questions or logistics or meetings, and, and those really aren't, you know, legal advice. Um, and when it comes to work product, you have to think about, you know, is this work, either the communication or documents being written, really performed in anticipation of litigation? A lot of times you ask your lawyer something and maybe they write you something, but it has nothing to do with litigation. Maybe you just want to sort of know something. And so that can just maybe be in the advice category, but not work product. So there's a lot of stuff there that, you know, maybe isn't always privileged and you really have to be thoughtful about it because if you do have litigation, especially, you know, Heather, as you mentioned, you know, the CCPA risks and, and the penalties there, um, you want to be thinking about those issues up front. Um, the, the privilege issues get a little bit more complicated when you're working with third parties. So for example, if, if uh, a company hired uh, Andreas, you help them with a breach, and then Andreas engaged Greg to help uh, investigate the incident. Well, some of the work Greg's doing might be subject to the attorney client privilege, but maybe some of it wouldn't be. And there's a lot of factors to consider, and courts have really taken a little bit of a harder line look at um, privilege, especially when working with third parties. So there's a lot of considerations there. And I think the key is you know, really to be thoughtful about it and to be thinking about it up front, because it's really hard to make that argument once you sort of made some missteps early on. And of course, the law of privilege applies very differently outside of the United States. So, um, you know, fortunately, I think when a, a foreign lawyer is advising a U.S. entity, that entity will still be entitled to assert privilege where it's been properly maintained. But if a claim is before a regulator or a court in jurisdiction that doesn't recognize privilege, things can get tricky when, you know, you're trying not to waive privilege back home. So we've been focusing on U.S. law in today's discussion, but the proliferation of privacy laws and breach notification laws around the world are also raising the risk stakes. There are a handful of regions around the world where local privacy laws require notification of a breach, irrespective of whether there's a risk of harm to consumers. So if you have a breach, you have to report it. And some of those jurisdictions, like Turkey, for example, they are going to post your notice immediately on their website in a classic name and shame fashion. And so, you know, 
if you have data or business operations outside of the United States, my recommendation would be to plan now for what is your cascading decision tree of notification and how does one notification potentially influence the other? So for example, if you're a public company, thinking now about how Turkey tipping your hand could impact the timing of your 8K filing, or whether you just want to take your hit in Turkey for delayed notification so that the country doesn't necessarily drive your notification strategy, there's a handful of other jurisdictions just like that, that um, similar no, no, no threshold, right? So you've got South Korea, India, South Africa, and more. Um, so if you're operating around the world, in addition to incorporating the privacy law considerations into your incident response process, you need to layer in those global considerations as well. So Bruce, I think um, we wanted to do just quick final thoughts, but I think we're running out of time. We are pretty much out of time. Uh, can we do them in a, you know, a minute total? <laughs> minute or less. I'll start with you, Andreas. Final thoughts for us? Yeah, I'll give a quick final thought and it'll build on the data minimization piece, right? Um, if, if you take nothing else from it, take this. If you're not familiar with these privacy laws now, or if you're a company that, that is going to be newly subject to these, keep in mind in the incident response process that your incident notification may very well trigger a broader inquiry into your general compliance with, with the law. We are seeing this absolutely in the EU right now, where you notify about a simple breach and all of a sudden you're answering a whole lot of questions from a regulator about your general uh, compliance with the law. Why did you have this data in the first place? Why did you keep this data longer than you needed to? It has nothing to do with the actual security controls. It's more about these data, data protection principles we talked about at the beginning. So be thinking about uh, this because it further complicates your incident notifications and what that follow-up might look like. Great, Sunil? Yeah, so piggybacking off of what Andrea said, um, I think one of the most important points is to really understand what data you have as a company. Um, it can really help with complying with the law, uh, privacy laws, but also help you in, in responding to an incident because there's just so many times where we've seen companies say, well, I don't have that type of data. And well, it turns out they did. And um, you want it, it can help with both privacy and security. And Greg? And I think two, two quick points. <clears throat> I think one, uh, to help with the continuous um, <clears throat> assessing and, and testing, you know, utilize frameworks that are already out there, NIST, ISO, you know, those are fantastic frameworks and, and can really help you to, to take a look at your security and your privacy program. Um, and the other thing is, uh, it's, it's not just about technology, technical controls. Sometimes uh, you know, companies think that, oh, I just need to look at my security controls that are in the NIST framework and I'll, I'll be good. Uh, really understanding where that data is. So, you know, talk with your, talk with your team members, uh, you know, especially on the operational side, on the business side, and make sure you have a great understanding of where that information lives and, and how it's accessed and how it's managed. And uh, that, that will really help focus your assessment so that you're assessing what's the areas that are most important. Thanks, Greg. And so Bruce, we've got a bumper sticker coming out of this. It's death, taxes, and no such thing as perfect security. Let's stick into it. Awesome, we'll put it on the website. Um, thank you, Heather, great job. Uh, and, and Greg, Andreas, and Sunil, thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, really interesting topic, really uh, another topic that just changes so quickly.